So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, or good afternoon, good morning, and uh, perhaps uh, good evening to, to some of you. And I think uh, in some of the Pacific countries, it's still Sunday. So uh, good afternoon, Sunday uh, to you. But thank you all for joining today. Uh, we see this as a very um, important initial uh, 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 statistics Cafe jointly run by um, ourselves in uh, SDD, the Statistics for Development Division of the Pacific Community and uh, our colleagues at uh, SCAP who have been initiating these, uh, these Statistics Cafe uh, meetings for some considerable time. But it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's great that we've had the opportunity to, to join together. Um, for this uh, specific uh, activity that is targeted primarily, um, but not solely, at um, our Pacific uh, Pacific countries. Um, I think that uh, we found over the years that the um, problems and experiences of the Pacific countries are often very different to those experiences from our Asian neighbours in the SGAP region. Um, and this is an opportunity for us to look more specifically at, uh, at the Pacific Island uh, situation. So this afternoon or today we have, uh, we have hopefully if everyone is able to join us we have five presentations um, from uh, the Australian Bureau of Statistics from uh, the Kiribati uh, National Statistics Office uh, from uh, the research and development branch of the statistics division in PNG um, from the Fiji Bureau of Statistics and our own uh, statistics for development division here so without further ado, I will invite uh, Ms. Judith uh, Coleman from the Australian Bureau of Statistics to open our proceedings. Judith is um, an acting director in the data integration and services branch at the ABS. And Judith's team, uh, um, for their work, they acquire data from other agencies for the purpose of data integration, which I think is a really important aspect of the work that we are now looking at uh, across the Pacific region. And Judith has worked on the Australian data strategy, which is a model, I think, for many of us to, to look at. Um, and uh, she was doing that while seconded to the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet in 2021 and she continues to be involved in cross-governmental data groups. So uh, uh, over to you, Judith. Thank you very much indeed and welcome. Many thank you, David. Um, that's a lovely um, intro you've done there. Um, and hello to everyone else um, dialing in from all around the place. It's lovely to be here with you today. Um, very briefly um, about the ABS, I'm sure you're all aware of some of its key roles. Um, it is Australia's national statistics organisation um, and we run surveys and produce statistics on a, a, a range of topics, economy, labour, industry, people and health, as well as the five yearly census, the last of which was in uh, 2021. Um, and as David mentioned there, um, my area of work is in statistical data integration. Um, so today I'll be giving a brief introduction uh, to two areas where the the ABS is a, a data leader. Firstly, um, uplifting government workforce capability through the um, APS data profession, so that's the Australian Public Service Data Profession, and also looking at enabling greater use of government data through um, data integration. Next slide, please. So when we're talking about enabling data policy to make some of these um, changes and um, innovations, um, it, to, we need to work from the top down as well as employing specialist skills at the operational level. Um, and there are varying capability and maturity levels across agencies um, that I uh, imagine there are some parallels with um, the different uh, groups that are dialing in today um, in terms of different um, data maturity and capability. So this is something we experience within Australian government as well. In terms of guiding the direction, um, this is in our case set by whole of government um, drivers of data policy and data initiatives um, can be led by various agencies and in the public benefit. So some examples of government led cross agency um, data initiatives um, in the Australian government are the Australian Data Strategy, 
um, we have an open data policy um, and there is um, an AI ethics principles work that's being done as well, um, as well as the, uh, the national data disability asset, which is a huge undertaking currently underway. Um, and in terms of legislation that enables this, um, we have this year had the Data Availability and Transparency Act um, ratified, and that's something that's currently being implemented across agencies and is expected to increase our capability for sharing data between agencies um, from, that, from that legislative um, standpoint. So that's sort of big picture whole of government. The next level down is the idea of setting the boundaries. Um, so we need to have agreed approaches and processes in place between the, the parties involved. So this could be between government agencies or Commonwealth and jurisdictional governments, or even um, between government and non-government organisations. So some of the key um, things we need in place here are partnerships and, and agreements um, and also operating models so that there are common visions and goals that, um, that the involved parties are all working towards. Um, in terms of uh, the operational level, we want to be ensuring um, an implementation, we want to be ensuring safe use of, of data. Um, this in, requires governance frameworks, delegations, secure system, things like that. So um, I'll move on to the next slide, please, and uh, talk a bit about the data profession. So in 2018, the Australian government commissioned an independent review, which found that the APS needed a, a whole of service wide transformation to achieve some better outcomes in the data space. Um, and it, it noted that the APS should be able to make better use of data and analytics to generate deeper insights for, for government decision making. Um, so in response to this, the recommendations from this review, the, um, the Public Service Commission established three professional streams, they called it. Um, the first of these was a human resources profession, the second was a digital profession, and the third is the data profession. And this is the one um, launched in September 2020. It, was, it is being led by um, the ABS and our Australian statistician is the head of the data profession. Next slide, please. Um, so the data profession stream is a two year work program with 25 agencies actively participating and it's a co-designed approach um, with governance at the executive levels across those agencies. It is an ambitious work program um, and it's designed to build the foundations of a sustainable data profession um, for new people coming into this, the public service, but also uh, it's an opportunity to uplift existing APS data capability. Um, and across those contributing agencies, um, they are all uh, have a role in designing, testing and championing the initiatives that um, are being rolled out. Next slide, please. Uh, so an update on what the profession has achieved so far. Over the last couple of years, um, the, the data profession has already made some great strides in, in uplifting capability. Um, the data professional network at the top left there was established um, and currently has over 2,100 members. So this network was created to guide and share data profession, sorry, professional data standards and best practice. Um, there is a LinkedIn group that's been created and also a membership, a member community platform, um, which has also been set up. And the, the role of those platforms and communities is to really help data professionals to connect and, um, and be able to uh, share knowledge and, um, and create those networks amongst them themselves. Um, the data, data graduate recruitment initiative in the middle up the top, um, this promotes um, recruitment of, of data specific graduates. So it's also led by the ABS on behalf of the whole public service. Um, and through these, um, these processes, um, we've recruited data analysts, um, data scientists, statistical methodologists, and more for over 40 agencies. Um, and so last year alone, there were actually around 140 graduates placed um, in those agencies through this data uh, graduate recruitment process. 
Um, an evolving initiative is the data job roles, um, just at the bottom left there. So uh, as an example, um, one of our partner agencies, the Australian Tax Office, has developed a series of standard data role job descriptions, which cover roles such as data scientist, data engineer, statistician, and so on. Um, and these roles... Uh, map directly to a, a, capabil a data capability framework. So the idea is to provide a common framework and language um, to aid in recruitment for those data roles. And um, as I mentioned, also to uplift the capability of, of existing data professionals um, and provide some um, further career paths for people already in the public service as well. I'll move on to the next slide. Um, so I'm going to talk now about the idea of uplifting data use. Um, and as mentioned, my area of knowledge is, is integrated data. So um, data integration is a key enabler of um, innovative government data use um, with the goal to maximise the value of existing data assets while ensuring the safety, security and, and privacy um, around people and business, people's information in particular, but also um, businesses as well. So with data integration, uh, we bring together um, data from different sources to create new insights that wouldn't otherwise be possible. Um, this can help to answer tricky data questions that may not um, be able to be analysed from a, a, a single data source. Um, we do this in a highly secure environment with very strong privacy protections um, and researchers access the, only the de-identified data. Uh, in what we call the ABS Data Lab. So that's a secure virtual uh, access portal. Um, there are hundreds of research projects that have been generated using ABS integrated data, and that's across a wide variety of research topics. So the examples I've got on here um, are an education project, um, one which is around environmental disaster response, the heat waves one, and um, a labour market example um, about uh, tracking the um, real-time uh, economic changes in the labour market. Um, we take a privacy by design approach um, to data integration. Uh, we take that very seriously. We consult with the public around changes in how we're using and handling their personal information. Um, and the goal, overarching goal of that really is to um, build and maintain the trust of the public without which um, none, of, <clears throat> none of our operations would be, would be possible. Next slide, please. So this is a busy slide, but it always gets a good reaction. Um, MADAP is our person level data asset. Um, MADAP stands for the Multi-Agency Data Integration Project. And this is a, a, a project that links together data from uh, a variety of population and research, uh, sorry, population and social research domains. Um, MADAP is a partnership across key government agencies. Um, it was established in 2017 and since then has continued to grow both in volume and in scope of the data that's linked with it. Um, it includes administrative data from across government, such as social payments information, migration data, and personal income tax information. But MADAP also has other types of ABS data. Um, the census is linked, um, along with some important ABS surveys, particularly um, in the space of health and disability. So um, I hope these slides will be shared with the group. Um, I know that these, this one and the next one are a lot to take in. So please have a look in your own time and follow the web links if you do want to learn a bit more. Next slide, please. Um, we have an equivalent data asset for bringing together business level data across government as well. This one's called BLADE, the Business Longitudinal Analysis Data Environment, um, and it uses Australian Business Number or ABN to bring data together about, uh, about at the business level. Um, it also includes administrative data from across government as well as um, some key ABS surveys in the business space such as business characteristics and um, employee earnings and hours. Move on to my last slide here. 
Um, so finally, I'd like to share this case study with you. So this was an initiative that stemmed um, out of the COVID-19 pandemic and has had a significant impact on how the Australian government was able to respond to the pandemic. So in 2012, the ABS worked um, very closely with the Department of Health to link immunisation register data with MADAP. This data set um, had not previously been linked. Um, so it provided a really crucial, um, it filled a really crucial um, information gap that we had. Um, we, uh, in partnership, arranged for regular updates to the immunisation data in MADAP um, at a monthly frequency, I believe it was. And this is more frequent than um, a lot of the updates are. The updates to data in MADAP tend to be more like quarterly or six monthly or annually. So to have it coming in that frequently and to be able to service um, that need um, really allowed the Department of Health to analyse the trends um, in vaccinations much more quickly. Um, the goal was to inform vaccine uptake and an area that arose from uh, that analysis um, was that there was a lower uptake among certain language groups. So this was identified identified at a, um, from a ge geographic analysis. Um, and so this then allowed the Department of Health to really target um, the vaccine support and promotion uh, more directly and with um, culturally appropriate campaign campaigns and support um, and the, uh, the result of that was um, to see those vaccination rates lifting over time, which is obviously a really good outcome for us all. So I think I'm, I'm at time. I'll leave it there, but happy to take any questions now or um, uh, pass my details on for anyone who'd like to follow up at a later date. Thank you very much indeed, Judith. That was a really uh, interesting presentation and, and shows, uh, I think, uh, to us all the importance that um, that Australia, the ABS in particular, um, are putting on on data, data integration. I think it's something that um, many of our Pacific member countries uh, could could take uh, take stock of in a sense because quite often we look at data in a very siloed way and we're not using as much data integration as we could and I think that uh, uh, making that data more widely available to everyone so that they can see the integration will uh, will certainly help to encourage people to become more uh, statistically literate so that um, we can then begin to make a lot more of the data that we are all collecting um, almost by the day but uh, which often doesn't uh, doesn't as get doesn't get as much exposure as um, as it would be desirable so perhaps now we can we can move on um, do we have uh, Orewa here is she, has she joined uh, yeah I uh, yeah I see she's here Orewa so could I invite you to discuss a little bit about um, about the situation in Kiribati, please. For those of uh, you who uh, are not aware, Orewa is uh, engaged in the collection and compilation, analysis and dissemination of statistical information in Kiribati uh, relating to commercial, industrial and social indicators for the Kiribati population. And uh, Orewa is the uh, is the deputy Republican statistician for um, the Kiribati National Statistics Office. So Orewa, can I uh, can I invite you to make your presentation and welcome this afternoon? Thank you. All right, well, I can see you, but you're on mute. Oh, okay, uh, sorry. Have you there a presentation co copy with you, Kai? So... Nadim, um, are we showing uh, or I was? Yeah, yeah, it's ah, on the screen. We are. It's on the screen. Okay, okay. Okay, that is a uh, uh, try to provide this presentation that I need to present on behalf of Arista because she's very busy today. So, 
that is the, the presentation is based on the data literacy in Kiribati. Yeah, and that next slide, please. Okay, that is the content of the, the presentation, the types of data collected, the analysis, and the data uses in policy making, statistical literacy, way forward, and training gaps. That is the content of the presentation today. Next slide, please. Okay, that is the types of data collected in Kiribati. There is our primary data collected, secondary and big data, which contains the primary contains the survey data, the census data, and um, in the secondary, all administrative data from data sources, private data sources are not a part of the collection. And the, the last one for the big data, no collection has been done and we'd like to include, include a, that in the law. But that's that for the, the, the data and the knowledge and the understanding of how to collect the data. Yeah, next slide, please. Hello, are you hear me? We can hear you. Yes, uh, yes. all right, well, we. Okay, okay. And the next one on the national on the national statistical system. Yes, we can um, see Kiribati. that. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. And that is Kiribati's planning to, to develop the NSS in Kiribati. So all, all the Tara producers from the old ministries will, will be mandated to be a part of that NSS or the national statistical system. And all government and non government organizations will produce uh, according to the power of the law uh, to be regulated. So the coordination will provide, co produce coordinated official statistics for Kiribati to all users, both national and international. And the next, the next slide is, is based on the reality of using data for policy making. There is the, the what happens in reality, um, use data, using the data to policy or making policy and some data and policy making with no data. As you can see in what happens in reality now in Kiribati. So the users in data in policy making, not all users are statistical literate, especially when the data are against the direction of the policy. Although most policy makers tend to seek data to ensure they have a prepared a sound policy. That is the reality of using data for policy making here in Kiribati. Next slide, please. In the statistical literacy, literacy project, at this stage in Kiribati, there is no program that formally, formally carry out to increase the statistical illiteracy in Kiribati. But uh, all requests are 
study to ensure users understand the data they requested. For example, we often were called to present to parliament to present the data that we have. And also the KNSO needs project to increase the capacity building on delivering this to the public and some of our organizations. And the way forward for this presentation is um, more education or encourage new curriculum, more workshops or training with users, and more effective ways of dissemination or reaching out of the population. And for the training caps, the data analysis and writing statistical reports, we need that one. And there is a, a, an effective dissemination method and there is a statistical calculation instead of the cap that we have in KDFS. So that's all from, from here that I'm trying to discuss with Arista Hunt this presentation that she prepared from the first place and I need to, to present you that he pass it on to me. So thank you. Thank you very much, Indira Orewa. That was uh, a really interesting uh, presentation on the issues and challenges that um, that you're facing with the Kiribati National uh, Statistics Office and and with setting up your NSS in uh, in Kiribati. I think it emphasises perhaps the the importance that uh, that we need to place on what uh, uh, Judith had said in the earlier presentation about the importance that um, certainly Australia sees in having uh, strengthened data integration. Um, obviously, making the best use of that data requires it to be integrated. And in order to be integrated, um, we need to have high quality statistical literacy. So I think there's there's you know uh, something that uh, that Kiribati can really aspire to. And uh, obviously, those of us uh, in training institutions such as SDD and SCAP and uh, CAP and the other um, agencies around the region and within the wider um, global uh, economic system, um, we can learn a lot from what you have said in terms of what the what the needs are in terms of analysis um, and dissemination and uh, being able to do the statistical calculations and understand those calculations. So thank you very much indeed. We'll perhaps come back to you with some questions uh, later on. But now let's uh, let's move on um, to Sarah from uh, Papua New Guinea. Is Sarah online? Um, David, can we request that she be presenting at the last because she's still oh. having a problem with the connection? Connection. Okay, fine. So uh, I think we've already seen Isikeli online. So can I ask uh, Mr. Isikeli uh, Senebulu from uh, the Fiji Bureau of Statistics to um, to make his presentation on the um, Fiji experience of statistics literacy and uh, data integration for um, for a bit of bio on Isikeli. Um, Isakeli provides timely and expert advice on all corporate services, coordinates for the planning, preparation and implementation of the department's capacity um, and development activities. So I think that's a really good uh, uh, area to be involved with when we're talking about statistics literacy. So over to you, Isakeli. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. MC, uh, Mr. David Abbott. The Australian Bureau of Statistics uh, Managing Director, Mr. Judith uh, Coleman, the Director for the Statistic Advisor, Mr. Nadim, and uh, my Pacific re representative and my fellow participant, Bulavinaka, to you all. I will be on behalf of the Chief Executive for the Fiji Bureau of Statistics and members of the Senior Executive Forum and my fellow colleagues here in Fiji 
uh, for the Department of Statistics, known as the Fiji Bureau of Statistics, will, on behalf of them, I will be delivering the stats cafe in this stats cafe for the statistical literacy for Fiji. Next slide, please. Okay, this is uh, on the importance of uh, statistical literacy in the policy making process. Uh, there is a need to link the volumes of data and policy making process. Uh, this is with regards to the NSO uh, producing different types of statistics and for it to be effectively uh, used by policy makers, they should be able to understand these statistical reports so that appropriate policy recommendation could be made to government. <clears throat> Uh, bullet point number two, the lack of effective uh, utilization of data due to lack of data analysis efforts. The stakeholders uh, do not have the right uh, data analysis skills to effectively utilize uh, detailed data available at the NSOs. Uh, next is on the communicating uh, the policy objectives and outcomes required adequate uh, statistical literacy to communicate uh, statistical information. Uh, this is with regards to uh, when we're able to convince uh, stakeholders for policy formulation and implementation if we're able to support it with relevant uh, statistical information. And uh, the number four, the statistical literacy is required to set goals uh, at uh, for national development plans, monitor them and document um, uh, progress and ways forward. Uh, if people are statistically literate, they would be able to analyze and understand uh, the issues and concerns shown through the different types of uh, statistics. Next slide, please. Okay, the common uh, the common challenges for policymakers to use official statistics: uh, lack of understanding on statistical outputs and its methods. Uh, proper methodology guide, uh, guides are not available for some statistical compilations. Uh, access to disaggregated data. Sometimes stakeholders do not get the detailed data they need, and this would limit uh, uh, their data analysis and suggestion. Uh, the lack of human resources to monitor, evaluate detailed activity data. The lack of statistical analysis expertise for effective use of data for policy making process, the high staff uh, turnover and lack of statistical training. And uh, lastly, uh, similar to bullet point one, lack of te technical manuals, guidelines, standards and classification, standardized coding and definitions. Next, please. So what can be done to address the, the challenge of statistical literacy in the public sector. Uh, first is capacity building plan that could address the following areas, covering NSOs, NSS and planners, uh, particularly in the Pacific. Uh, data processing, uh, data analysis, uh, validation and report writing, statistical uh, forecasting, use of uh, statistical uh, software for different uh, needs, analysis and dissemination, and uh, communicating data to stakeholders. And also uh, for knowledge sharing, uh, more resources for development and or collection of data on new areas of statistics, example, the Mix Plus, uh, pandemic uh, assessment survey, etc. Uh, for the NSOs to be more independent or so autonomy. And also you have to strengthen the statistical system within the country known as the National Strategy for the Development of Statistics. And uh, in the region, uh, maybe a quarterly roundtable discussion among uh, NSOs, uh, staff exchange programs, work attachment, South-South collaboration, etc. Next slide, please. And uh, these are the areas uh, to focus for stakeholders. Uh, 
provide more comprehensive and interesting reports, improve data accessibility, raise awareness and market uh, statistical uh, uh, products, need to address lack of technical uh, manual guidelines, standards and classification, standardized coding and definition, uh, produce timely non-economic indicators, example, labor market data, inco income inequality and environment. Uh, when more data analysis should be undertaken for statistical products, improve timeliness for statistical outputs, regularly consultative review of current publication, upskilled employees with the latest uh, statistical system, harmonize methodologi methodological approaches to survey across all government departments, and uh, finally, the need to strengthen collaboration, communication with the uh, stakeholders. That's all from uh, the, the Department of uh, Statistics from Fiji. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Isikeli. That um, that's an interesting discussion. Um, I, I think uh, it's interesting too that uh, many of the problems that um, and challenges that uh, are being faced in in Fiji around building statistical literacy and the use of data are, are in fact quite common between um, your office in the Fiji Bureau and and the much smaller office in the Kiribati uh, NSO. Um, so although there is a quite a big difference between the number of staff that are employed in the in the two statistics offices, the challenges that are being faced are, are very similar and, and they very much point to the need for more data integration. They, they point to the need for greater sharing of data and I think that's very important to note that um, much of the data that you were saying in your in your final slide there um, about uh, making more use of the data, much of that is in fact administrative data or can um, be obtained from administrative data resources. So I think it's something that uh, many, many governments need to perhaps pay more attention to and this is something indeed that uh, over the last uh, couple of years during the COVID period that uh, we at SDD and, and also I think in uh, SCAP have been encouraging governments to make more um, administrative data available for um, easy and quick analysis because it's it's quite clear that in many countries uh, a lot of uh, administrative data is collected on a very regular and quite frequent basis and whilst it might not necessarily be always a hundred percent or um, really completely up to date it is often very much better than not having any data at all and I think it's uh, really important to to make uh, make that point across to the national statistical systems, um, whether you're just developing them as they are in, in Kiribati or in Fiji, where you've had a, a national strategy for the development of statistics for some time and uh, maybe more um, emphasis can be given to implementing that aspect of it, the sharing of the data that um, that many government ministries could provide. So having said that, it's a very interesting progression. Um, I wonder, do we yet have um, Sarah from Papua New Guinea on board? Sorry, David, I think uh, you need to make uh, the last presenter. OK, well, I'm very sorry, everyone. It seems that um, the the gremlins of the uh, the communication system across the Pacific have got us once again. Um, but I'm very pleased to say that we have uh, Nadim Akhtar, um, one of our key staff here at SDD in uh, in the Pacific community, who will now um, give us an overview. I think uh, Nadim joined SDD quite recently uh, in March of this year um, and brings quite a lot of about 15 years experience um, in statistics capacity development and, and analysis and I'm sure that Nadim 
has been taking many notes um, of what has been said today because Nadim will be leading uh, much of our work in capacity development over the coming coming years and uh, noting the gaps um, and the training needs that have been mentioned by both uh, by both uh, Kiribati and uh, Isakeli from Fiji, I think he will have a very full notepad to um, to work from. So, Nadim, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. <clears throat> and thank you very, uh, so very much, everyone. So very interesting discussion happening here about the statistical literacy and the capacity development in the region. So I will be just discussing some of the points um, around the topic and we'll be trying to uh, give an overview of the Pacific. So let me know if everyone can see my presentation, my slides or not. We can see it. OK, so it is in the <clears throat> presentation format. Yes. OK, great. Thank you very much. OK, so <clears throat> so we are discussing about uh, the statistical literacy challenge and data use uh, challenge in the in the Pacific. So with respect to uh, major developments that happened. In this field, so we just try to understand where the Pacific country stands and what are the particular challenges that we can identify uh, at the main uh, points that we could, could focus in the coming years so we could have a real tangible or measurable improvement on the uh, statistical literacy side. Uh, so a little bit on the background. So when we talk about the statistical literacy, so this appears uh, to be an indicator which uh, which is which is widely discussed across the across the community where the data and analysis and the dissemination are considered an important components and as the policy is heavily dependent on the quality information that we generate um, uh, more often and a lot of resources has been uh, dedicated to this component but how we know that where the statistical literacy <coughs> is in terms of a particular country or what type of the statistics are being used in the country when they are generated by the national statistical offices and how the policies are reflected. So we see that there is some background work done by the Paris 21. <clears throat> and before that, the emphasis uh, on the statistical literacy uh, was mentioned uh, in the in in the road to dignity by 2023 uh, report the by the UN Secretary General where he stressed that the world must acquire a new data literacy to address the uh, respond to the challenges uh, for the new transformative agenda. So the transformative agenda when it is linked with the sustainable development goals and other regional um, uh, development priorities so that need to be based on the data and so the evidence that that could be extracted from the data when it is timely collected quality is ensured and then when it's reflected into into the policies that could only be possible when we have the capacity building available when the data is segregated <clears throat> and when we can widely share the information uh, so that a debate around the policy topics could be this could be started and most stakeholders could in, could be involved and then a more common understanding on the particular issues <coughs> could be um, could be considered and then we see there some practical work which was done by partnership in statistics for development in 21st century which we know by the name of paris 21 uh, when they developed the framework on the statistical literacy in 2016 uh, 2016 when it was the initial work that actually uh, was based uh, on developing a framework where uh, some of the uh, statistics that being uh, produced in the countries when they are used and discussed 
um, publicly in terms of uh, dissemination in the newspapers and other national documents uh, then uh, then then it could be quantified that what level of the statistical literacy that exists in the countries and the, this framework is basically based on the three levels and the level one is the basic level, which we uh, we say as, as a consistent but non-critical use of the statistics. So we see that when when the official statistics are produced and when they are discussed into the national newspapers, for example, so we can see that a lot of uh, uh, newspapers then discuss the numbers with the, which were generated by the national statistical system. And then the second level is critical use of the statistics, which is a further uh, uh, an analysis based on those statistics, a discussion that starts about those uh, data points. So uh, and the level three is critical mathematical assessment when the questions are generated from those statistics, when areas and the gaps are identified, for example, when the policymakers would like to have an answer to an underlying policy problem. So those uh, statistics that has been generated and shared, how those could help to fill that gap and to and sometimes the new questions are raised for example disaggregation or some communities which are marginalized or the gender statistics which are not widely shared so sometimes these dis, uh, disaggregations and other questions are generated out of those statistics so the level 2 and level 3 are considered the critical engagement with with statistics that actually is process for the policy making and when we talk about <clears throat> these levels, so we see that uh, we could, when when this frame was, framework was developed, we see that a uh, lot of information for different countries was available when uh, it was generated. So this was this is actually a text mining exercise, um, which is um, uh, which is an analysis, statistical analysis of the information that has been produced. But we can see that a lot of countries in the Pacific um, were actually, <coughs> sorry, not part of the initial uh, framework that was being developed at that time. Uh, so we we see that there is no statistics and this is the level one. So level one is basically talks about uh, the basic mention of the numbers which are uh, which could be the, the population of the country, um, uh, which could be about the financial indicators, which could be about uh, gender indicators or the SDG progress, uh, something like that. But that was not part of uh, the initial um, findings. And then we have the level two, which is uh, critical engagement with the, stat, uh, with the statistics and we, we we can see still see that the Pacific countries uh, there was no um, uh, uh, progress of the data men, uh, uh, mentioned into the into the framework probably either they were not covered or there was a not lot of information available uh, so the ranking of the Pacific countries on these indicators of the levels could be could be shown here but we see that over the time this uh, this has start start emerging for the Pacific. So for the Pacific from 2017 onward, we can see that <clears throat> the baseline values for some countries in the Pacific, not all countries here, uh, there are very few countries, particularly these are the only countries which are part of the International Development Association. Uh, these are the group members of the World Bank, um, which normally the World Bank publish the data on, on many of the different aspects of their national economies and the population statistics and all those areas. And we see that and those countries were having some sort of uh, representation on the statistical literacy. So we can see that <laughs> overall, sorry, <laughs> overall in Eastern Asia, we see that uh, in um, the trend on the level one was decreasing, uh, but the level two and level three a little bit uh, take over, uh, particularly the level three, which is the critical engagement of the statistics when uh, we analyze in depth the, the numbers that we have. But for the Fiji, we see that uh, there was a uh, there is a little decrease in the level one uh, over the time, uh, but the level one, which is the basic mentioning of the statistic generated, was much higher than the level one and level two. And similarly for the Kiribati, we have uh, uh, decreasing trend uh, 
uh, and there there is a uh, the level two is almost uh, constant over, over over the over the time, and level three was also um, decreasing. But the data was only available from 2018 up to 2019. So after that, no data is available. In Micronesia, we have the critical. Uh, I mean, this figure is a little bit critical in the way that the level one has increased. And when we look at uh, this increase, so only the COVID, when the COVID uh, started uh, affecting the community, so the statistics, the basic statistics, the number of the people affected, the vaccination and all those things were started discussing in the in the, in the national newspapers, in the national documents. And then we see that there is a, in 2020, there is a real increase into the level one um, in the statistical literacy. And Solomon Island, we have uh, uh, an increasing trend for the level one, but uh, the other two levels are uh, stagnant over the time. In Tonga, we have level uh, one and level two a little bit increasing. The level three is uh, stagnant over the, over the period. Uh, Tuvalu, the, I mean, we can see from all countries that the level one are basically uh, it is higher than the other 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 two levels. Uh, for Tuvalu, we see that there is a constant increase into mention of the statistics and level two, which is uh, uh, somehow a little un bit analysis, further analysis on the statistics taking part from 2019 to 22. This is probably again related to the sum of the analysis of the COVID statistics. Uh, which were related to the health pen, uh, issues and the uh, and the vaccinations uh, and that the people who were affected by the COVID and same was the situation for the Vanuatu. So this is some sort of uh, mathematical measurement that happened on statistical literacy. But there's a uh, there's an uh, there's a lot of uh, countries in the and in, in the Pacific for which we don't know what level of the statistics are being discussed at the national level. Okay, so there, here's a little bit of uh, hypothetical uh, example in which, for example, uh, <clears throat> every country is now signatory of the sustainable development goals. So we have the international commitments, we have the national and the regional commitments. Uh, we are also talking about the open data. Uh, there, there are data sources which provide information about every country in the world, which under, under the open data frameworks, uh, open one word data is, is, is being managed um, as, as, as international platform. There's also an agenda in, of inclusive growth where no one is left behind. Gender data is getting streamlined when we have to disaggregate statistics by gender to see that if a particular gender uh, is falling behind or what are the challenges in terms of parity and then now the climate change uh, which is the prime focus for the for the coming years for at the strategic level so all these frameworks which are aimed to generate and to can, can create uh, create a consensus that there should be a data according to the framework and when the data is available, then this data could be used for the to make the policy responses, which then inform uh, the international uh, development strategies, the regional development strategies, as well as the national development strategies. But then we see that different trends on these uh, frameworks or the progress on these frameworks it has varying uh, trajectories based on uh, based on the success and the challenges the different countries face but we here just forget about the assumption that the policy responses are heavily dependent on the statistical literacy and data use capabilities and the practices within the national statistical system the policy makers when this has been achieved so we can uh, hypo it, it's it's a, it's a practical hypothesis that we can say that when more people are able to use the data uh, to interpret the data to analyze the data so probably the progress the the discussion the debate the progress on the national strategies would be much better than what it is now so this is an undetermined relationship between this assumption and the final outcome on these parameters so that's why the statistical literacy and data use uh, is a challenge that need to be focused at the regional level. So countries often use two, two types of the data. So first we have to understand the statistical literacy challenge in the context of data production, data use, and data-driven policy making. So first of all, data production is the primary focus, which 
I believe the NSOs are, are according to the resources and the capabilities, they're producing all the information that has been committed at the national level. Um, uh, so then the data is produced and how effectively the society is using that data to address the complex challenges is 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 the basic basic uh, question for everyone to uh, to see that how we are getting benefit of the data but when we could use the data then how that data actually reflects into the policy making because when we develop the national development plans we develop the national monitoring strategies of the of the goals that we set at the regional level or the national level even at the international level when we talk about the sdgs so then we have to see that how that data could actually influence the policies so <clears throat> there are two day type of the data sets i'm not spending a lot of time here because uh, uh, it's it's a very big subject. So normally, official statistics that come through the censuses, administrative uh, data sources, and uh, socioeconomic surveys. So this is uh, a periodic uh, production of the data, which, for example, census. Uh, normally are done after 10 years and the other surveys like the household economic integrated uh, economic surveys are done every five years so they can inform on the poverty and the policy making for the social protection and all these things so sdgs for example could come through different uh, household surveys uh, so this is more uh, 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 linked with the with with the commitments that the country has to report uh, we can also see that with respect to the other countries, uh, the Pacific region has to catch up uh, to ensure that all of the indicators that has the commitment at the sub-regional level, at the regional level, uh, that could be that could be achieved with the more production of the information. And then the second stage is more real-time use of the data, which which sometimes is not the population representative, but uh, it, it could address the specific challenges. Um, for example, data collected through the mobile phones, the traffic signals, and all those areas which could address the uh, particular challenges for example there are accidents happening in particular uh, time frame during du during the during the day and during the night then we can see we can measure the uh, what's happening we can then uh, you know decide on the on, on the speed limits monitoring of those particular roads and areas so this is mostly addressed but this is i believe there's the next challenge uh, that the Pacific, when meeting the first challenge of producing all the data that is required under the um, uh, official commitments to report the SDGs, then the next challenge is that how uh, the more uh, advanced and real-time data use could be could be ensured. And then. <clears throat> um, when we talk about the statistical literacy, it is also very important that we address the data production gaps. So when we have data production gaps, this also means that there's a limitation for, for the policymakers. So whenever they try to look into the data, or for example, when they try to update their policies at the national level, so when they go back to on the on, on the data producer available, so there's a gap. So this is a limitation which uh, hinders uh, the more uh, progressive way of using the statistics for the policy making. This, this is a little snapshot uh, on the economic indicators uh, from the Pacific countries, <clears throat> which we, we, we can see that out of the core 31 economic indicators. So there's a different uh, levels of achievement. Uh, Fiji is 90%. Uh, so this is the highest among all the uh, other countries, but there are countries really falling behind we can say that they need to invest more on data uh, data production before that data could be made available for the policy makers uh, to use that for example we can see the american samoa and samoa uh, american samoa is just 23% uh, uh, tuvalu is just 16% uh, and the rest are uh, have uh, also have the different uh, variabilities in this regard. So this is the one challenge before the statistical literacy. And at the same time, we see that there is no information available in some of the some of the dimensions, which which are particularly about, uh, uh, about the labor statistics, commodity prices, poverty is also um, an area where the more data is required to be produced on a regular basis to monitor the progress and see so to see that how the vulnerabilities at the population level uh, fluctuate it due to the uh, other problems or the natural uh, natural disasters or, uh, or the economic shocks and also we have to have some information on the the natural resource management and the climate change which is also a new priority for the region so when we talk about the sdgs as the more 
um, uh, committed, or you can say, uh, widely known field, and among all the Pacific countries, so we can, could identify only two countries where we can we can see the trend of STG index. So for Fiji, <coughs> we see that there is an increasing trend, and it is a more linear. The, with respect to the PNG particularly, and 2020 has affected uh, the COVID, which is the COVID pandemic, has affected somehow uh, the progress on the STG index. Um, <clears throat> but from 20, from 2000 to 2021, there is a real progress, significant progress happened on the STG um, uh, index. But when you look at the, uh, the PNG, so we see that it's a little bit uh, broken relationship in the way that we it it's it's it it goes up and it goes down. Um, uh, so this sometimes means that there, there sometimes the the data that needs to be collected was not collected. So there's no no information available on the achievement of the indicators. Uh, so the index value goes down. For example, when it is not available for some indicators and available <coughs> for some indicators, the, then the index value goes down and then sometimes index values goes up. So there is also in need within the Pacific to uh, <clears throat> to identify the resources uh, uh, for the SDGs as well. So this is a, just one example in this regard. But when we when we move from the P F uh, Fiji and PNG, so we have a Pacific roadmap uh, towards a sustainable development, uh, which talks about the Pacific countries only, and we have 131 indicators that are agreed at the regional level that the countries would be uh, uh, would be trying to achieve and would be producing the data for that. So this is just an example from uh, first quadrennial Pacific Sustainable Development Report that was produced in 2018. And the, with an example of three pillars, so first pillar, for example, talks about the prosperity and economic development, which has 23 indicators under this pillar. And we see that only 11 of those indicators have information available, and that information is not from all countries. So this is uh, the real gap in data production. Uh, similarly, for, for the pillar, another pillar, which is people and social development, we have 48 indicators. Uh, for an out of 48, we have 28 indicators covered and rest of uh, the indicators, there's no information available. And for the pillar three, which is plant and sustainable environment management, out of 33 uh, indicators for this pillar, there's only 11 indicators for which the information is available. So production challenge still persist for the Pacific. Uh, more work need to be done. And then we talk about some of the statistical capacity measurements. So we <clears throat> shifting from uh, the statistical literacy levels that are measured by the uh, Paris 21. So now we have World Bank indicators which talk about the national uh, statistical capacities. And now they, they talk about the performance, national statistical performance. So first indicator, uh, which was um, being collected up to 2020, we have information about uh, from uh, from 2000, uh, I think from 2005 to 2020 uh, for this indicator, which is statistical capacity indicator, uh, which is now transformed into statistical performance indicator. Um, which is a more complex one we will see in the next slide. But here, the, my point here is that SCI, which we talk about uh, its uh, uh, structure and how uh, that uh, index is made, uh, was based on the three components, the uh, three dimensions, which was a methodology, uh, source data, and periodicity. Uh, so any country, who, uh, all the countries who were measured, and they were all uh, the IDA member countries, so not not all uh, Pacific countries are again um, uh, covered here. So according to the methodology, which is okay, again the set as set by the World Bank standards. Uh, so for example, a CPI base year methodology, national accounts base year method, uh, methodology, uh, other methodologies um, which 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 are for example poverty estimation that that the World Bank has specific methodology for that. That. So they were ranking the uh, the countries based on uh, on the methodological approach and the standard methodology that uh, the World Bank uh, was requiring that every NSO and every NSS uh, actually adhere to. 
and then source data which is that from which type of the source that the particular data is coming so is it census is it these are the surveys are this the wild wild registration system and then the periodicity so uh, for example for the stgs and for the poverty for the uh, for the clean drinking water uh, these sort of the thematic areas which were covered so how, how the countries are basically um, making sure that every year or every five year whatever the periodicity is set for particular surveys they're actually adhering to that uh, requirement so this uh, sci looked more relevant uh, in terms of what happening what's happening into the low income countries in terms of um, the statistical performance but when we uh, when we look at these uh, parameters, so these are the two examples, which are again from the Pacific region. And the first uh, uh, the three blocks in a row are from the Kiribati, the below three blocks are from, from Fiji. So we can see that on the methodological side, so Kiribati was having a uh, low score, uh, but, but the Fiji was having a little bit high score with respect to that. Uh, and then we talk about the source data. Uh, Fiji has significant high score from the Kiribati. And from the periodicity, we see that the Fiji again has the high score, but the Kiribati is also uh, having uh, a good score on, on, on the periodicity. <clears throat> so here, before we uh, can discuss about the, the statistical performance indicator, here the important point is that still there is a challenge here in the Pacific that before we progress or make a more advanced and complex in, in index for the, for the statistical performance, first we have to make sure that all these uh, on these dimensions the countries actually uh, are, are progressed, they have achieved the minimum standards uh, so that they are ready to, uh, to take up on the next challenge. So this is the next challenge, which is statistical performance indicator. This is a progressed version um, of, the, of the statistical capacity indicator. It has five pillars and 22 dimensions. Um, there is a critique about these uh, dimensions and the, these uh, pillars because World Bank, uh, even from the developed uh, the high income countries is not able to collect some information uh, information on some of the dimensions for example for for the data use uh, we have legislatures executive and civil society and academia so there is no internationally agreeable or methodology proof indicator which actually measure these dimensions so the then this means that the pacific then would even not be catching up on that, even the, the, the other countries are not able to have some information on these. And then there is a, another challenge here, which we, in, the, in the second row, when we talk about the data services, the effectiveness of advisory and analytic services related to the statistics and the availability and use of the data services. So this is um, something, a new role that has been put into the hands and into the plate of the NSOs. So without having the particular methodology uh, are the capacity of the NSOs, the, are the resource allocation, are the identification of the resources that are required to have progress on that. So they have been given a new task which they would not be able to, uh, to show any real progress. So these are the some of the cri critical analysis. These, uh, these were the points also highlighted by Paris 21 again. Um, on these uh, these points. So uh, yeah, so so here I, I just would try to uh, show up some of the uh, performance on uh, SCI and SPI. The point here is that when we talk about the SCI, which was previously adopted by the World Bank, so we see that the the progress was not actually happening on this. So this is from 2015 to 2020. This is the five year, six year, sta six year statistics. So we see that Vanuatu, the score is decreasing and Tonga, the score, score has de uh, decreased, uh, increased initially after three years in 2018. And 2019, it was stable. And then 2020, of course, due to the COVID and pandemic, the score decreased. And the Solomon Island, there is a uh, differential uh, things happening a little bit increase and a little bit decrease. Samoa, there is a little trend, increasing trend, but the Fiji, we can see that uh, Fiji, most of the time we see that this 
NSO has better score with respect to the other countries, but we see here the Fiji score was also decreasing. But for, with when we compare these scores with the East Asia and the Pacific, for, for this region, we see the scores are increasing, but they are always significantly higher with respect to other uh, countries except Fiji. Uh, uh, so in comparison, so we see that still uh, countries were not able to progress on SCI, but they have given a new challenge, which is SP, SPI. But SPI, again, we tried to look here, Vanuatu, which was uh, on the SCI, it was under around 50, you can say, but here Vanuatu, it, it is around 40. But this is also based on very limited information because not all dimensions as uh, we discussed in the previous slide, there is information available. So this is a biased uh, score in the way that it actually does not represent the overall picture of the capacity or the performance of the NSOs. Um, then I think that there is, a, there is a proposition, I believe we can say that there is a need to benchmark capacity building for the Pacific, capacity level for the Pacific, so that we can identify the dimensions with the help of the NSOs and the other stakeholders. We can identify the resources, then we can identify the challenge, and then the progress could be measured over the time on those. And when the progress uh, is measured on those areas, then we can set the new target and the new uh, challenge. This is this is what is required because otherwise, uh, uh, as I mentioned, when there's a, there's a new job for the NSOs, but there are no resources and there is no definitions, there is no methodology for them to how to see that, how they have to do the advocacy, on what they have to do the advocacy. The data gaps are there, so when there is no data, so they can do the advocacy and all these things. So they have to be addressed in, 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 in a more um, understandable format. So then we can have uh, the bench, benchmark for the for the uh, for the uh, Pacific capacity. Can you all see my slide? Yep. Okay, great. So this is the last slide. Sorry, uh, taking a little bit more time. So so here, what we can discuss here and we can conclude is that measuring development progress in the Pacific is hard and the statistics available need strengthening. Uh, there would be better data driven policy making process in the Pacific if there were more statistical literacy, uh, particularly in the public sector, to make the more most of what data is available. Um, but measuring statistical literacy capacity is also hard and existing benchmarks for the Pacific are incomplete or sometimes are otherwise flawed we could have better results for statistical capacity building if we could target users better uh, and had a clear understanding of where the data analysis capacity gaps actually is. Uh, so also here that when we talk about the data users, so we actually don't exactly know who are the data users uh, in the Pacific for all the, the data that has been produced in the countries. Uh, and we also, because we don't know the users, so we also don't know what data gap uh, in their perspective exist in the Pacific. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, and that's all from my side. Any questions are most welcome. Thank, thank you very much, Nadim, for that um, very comprehensive overview. Um, I think we have uh, some time left now for questions. Uh, do we have any questions in the chat or does it has anybody uh, sent any questions by email? Do we have anything? I, I have one question here which um, which came in from uh, our colleague in the Vanuatu statistics offices, um, Jamie Tangwai. Um, he's, he's asked a very pertinent question relevant to um, much of what uh, has been said this afternoon that um, we we have a challenge in many of the Pacific countries that um, uh, there are not many statistically literate people at the moment um, in the public service or indeed in the private sector. Um, but there is a need, as we can see, that we really do need to try and ensure that we make better use of the statistics that are available. So how can we do that? Is it possible, he's asking, for um, us to perhaps use 
more visualization to get the message across to those who are not necessarily statistically literate. Now, I'm not sure whether this is something that has been tried in a, an experimental way. I mean, it's certainly something that we in SDD have been considering to try and improve the way that we um, advocate for a lot of the data that um, that we are working with um, countries, uh, working with countries with, um, to to put them into visualized form to get the message across to more of our users wherever they might be. I wonder um, if I could ask Judith if she is there whether there has been any experiments in in Australia. Australia with testing visualizations as a way of getting a message across on um, for statistical literacy purposes using more visualizations. David, can I uh, can I just request that we have one presenter left, Sarah? Oh, so Sarah, if, is she back on? Is she? <laughs> uh, Sarah, are she, you there? I I probably present uh, Nadim uh, David David for no, Sarah. No oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, go if well, you I can, can put justice to what uh, Sarah did. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry, I thought we'd lost Sarah, but but you please carry on. We can just address these questions after this presentation uh, from PNG. Yeah, can someone share the screen? Okay, as I mentioned, I I hope I can give justice to what Sarah. Did uh, probably the connection is really not good there because of the very strong earthquake that they had the other day or last day. Yeah. So next slide, please. This is just a quick presentation um, on the NSO background and then uh, the one that we're doing for data literacy and appreciation plans. Its status. And we did a lot of uh, focus group discussions to guide us on how to design our literacy and appreciation plans. And that also included what David has mentioned. Next slide, please. OK, uh, as a brief background of NSO, uh, it was established by an act of parliament uh, through the Statistical Services Act 1980, and this was revised. 1981. NSO is responsible to collect, compile, and disseminate statistical information on a regular and timely basis. Next slide, please. Um, among the mandated key functions are to produce statistics through censuses and surveys, um, coordinate and collect statistics from the NSS, and designate statistics as official statistics for utilization, dissemination, comparability, to ensure that it is uh, in conformity to a set of standards and internationally accepted statistical practices. However, census remains the main source of data. Um, and um, NSO has currently only 128 offices. In 2011 census population, um, it recorded about 7.2 million population, or in short, um, there is one officer for every 57,000 population in PNG. Um, they don't have the um, sub-national um, offices yet. Um, there is only one or two with officer in the provinces, but the rest are mainly um, at the national level. Thank you. Next slide, please. The censuses that were undertaken so far, um, there were four, and we we're supposed to have the 2020 census, but it was deferred due to COVID-19 and, uh, of course, the funding deficit that we had. Um, also, and it's so conducted three demographic and health surveys, 96, 2006, and um, the last one was in 2016 up to 2018. Um, the household income and expenditure survey was also collected. Next slide, please. Next, please. Um, now, 
we, we have other data collection exercises through the uh, funding su support from the Australian government and technical support from uh, UNFPA. So we have what we call the population model estimation. This is an innovative approach to generate quick population counts for the country through the use of high resolution satellite images with a combination of available data sets as inputs into a statistical model. So this is the first time ever in the Pacific that will be um, at, uh, used. This is particularly being utilized for areas where or countries where data collection or censuses is not possible or data collection is not complete. And then we have a nationally representative sample survey, which we call the social demographic and economic survey aims to generate important social demographic and economic indicators that can be used to monitor targets. And uh, for the SDGs, Medium Term Development Plan 3, PNG Vision 2050, and the National Population Policy and other monitoring tools. Uh, we have just conclude, uh, conducted this. The enumeration was uh, completed and we are now doing the processing. Thank you, please. Next slide. Uh, pres presently, NSO is conducting the following. Uh, one is what we call the data, data literacy program. And uh, soon we will be doing the provincial differential analysis, which focuses on uh, demographic dividend. Now, NSO has also its price survey, establishment survey, and international migration. The users, we have um, different users as well. And next slide, next slide, please. Now, PNG developed its statistical strategy from the Paris 21. So that is PNG uh, SD, SDS 2018 to 2027. The lead department is planning and NSO. Uh, the main drivers to coordinate and facilitate dialogue between all user and producer agencies. Uh, among other agencies identified in the PNG SDS, um, dissemination, accessibility, and utilization is one of the key area or have results information disseminated to the subnational level, especially. Uh, to date, almost nil user producer forum especially by NSO, so it's not very uh, active nowadays, uh, probably because of the effect of the COVID-19, where we have very little uh, discussions and uh, forum. Thank you. Next slide, please. Now, what, what type of analysis um, uh, NSO is currently doing is very basic. Uh, for uh, very complex analysis like uh, fertility, mortality, these are being outsourced, usually being done by um, consultants, international consultants. And uh, NSO has important users such as the national departments, provincial and local level government, research institutions, academe, private sector, and the media. Next, please. Now, given the very few censuses and surveys, it is expected that um, the data literacy in the country is very low. The country had very little exposure to the understanding of the importance of the data, how the data is collected, how it is preserved, how the data is used for decision making and others, and how to analyze and interpret the data. Um, so we have a very big problem actually in PNG because um, even uh, some some information in the media are correct, incorrectly stated. So um, it's it's a very huge problem on data literacy that we are planning really to at least start um, to, to educate the people, especially the planners. Hence, there's a need to plan to devise clear messages and communicate to target audiences. Thank you. Next slide, please. Now, as I mentioned, uh, we are currently conducting the focus group discussions with different groups of data users to determine the level of awareness and understanding of the data, the accessibility of the data, and their recommendations to improve the accessibility, 
the knowledge on where to access the data and what type of data they are using, what format is more understandable, useful for users. Uh, with that information, we will be able to design the data literacy and appreciation materials. Then after that, we will conduct the series of data literacy and appreciation works, workshops in all the 22 provinces with the provincial planners, the academe, the youth, the media, um, and probably the local level government planners as well. Next slide, please. So we, as I mentioned, we have the target targeted audiences to include national government, subnational that includes provincial districts, LLG, uh, civil society and advocates, youth and civil society, media and journalists and academics. Next slide. And we had conducted so far the FGDs for the youth, the media, the civil society, the national and provincial governments, the academe, and these were all conducted from May to September 2022. Next slide, please. Uh, so we managed to gather some uh, information from them, and we just tried whether they know something about the population of PNG, and uh, they have guessed, because as I mentioned, the last census was in 2011. So right now they are just guessing what is the estimate for uh, population of PNG in 2022. So the, the information they gave was that the uh, population was from 9.1 to 10.9 million. And that the NSO is the most common source of population data. Next slide, please. When asked about challenges to using data, respondents said they need more training. I think this is also part of the data literacy program that we are supposed to um, conduct and uh, design. Um, in that discussion, the two most common reasons for not using the data were the data is outdated, and that is really true. The data is not publicly available and requesting information is time consuming and difficult. This is a very good information in designing the data uh, literacy program for PNG. Another um, area is that um, when they were asked uh, how do they prefer uh, to, to receive the data or to access the data, so they said that they prefer using large data sets online rather than in print. Okay, next slide, please. Um, the partial results from the FGD gave some preliminary indication of the level of understanding and the need for training in understanding the results produced. However, prior to the FGDs, there was also an indication of how data and factual numbers are perceived. There was little to no demand for the need for data, or rather there was no avenue for the data users to voice, to voice their need for data. So everyone is just guessing because we don't have actual, aside from low, low level of literacy, uh, there's not much data in the country. So there's a need to produce data and then you also uh, couple that with data literacy activities and programs. Next slide, please. So the data literacy program has to identify the needs via FGDs and to use the results to design programs to educate and build anti shelving for data. And we have started this journey. Now with assistance of SPC, UNFPA and other partners, we can do more in the statistical literacy domain. This is the first activity for uh, PNG and we hope that we will be able to manage and sustain this activity. Next slide, please. Okay, what are the next steps? As I mentioned, there's a need to develop data literacy and appreciation materials given the information that we got from the FGDs, then conduct the data literacy and appreciation workshop in 22 provinces. We're hoping to start that in November up to March 2023 and uh, provide some information or data appreciation visibility in events such as the Statistics Day 
the Media and Information Literacy Week, the World Population Day, um, also um, on November 15th for the event award with uh, 8 billion. Next slide, please. Okay, that's the last slide. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, this this uh, four activities is through the Australian government and the NFA. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Dita, for, for uh, stepping in at short notice to um, to present on Sarah's behalf. I think that's it's very interesting that um, obviously in Papua New Guinea um, it's been recognised how important it is to build statistical literacy, and it's great to see that they have uh, they have begun to take an initiative. Um, I throw it open. We we actually passed our our hour and a half at the moment, but just. All we do, I um, posed a question to Judith. Unfortunately, Judith has had to uh, to leave. But uh, what she has uh, mentioned is that uh, the the data profession, um, the data professional, uh, what did she call it? The um, the data profession that. Um, across the public service in Australia is is a, an important step um, that uh, if you can establish a more uh, professional approach to statistics and understand of, understanding of statistics among a wider community of um, those who are interested in statistics, then it will make a, a, a big difference. And this is something that I think we could aspire to um, in partnership with um, with SCAP and with uh, with CAP and, and ourselves here at uh, Pacific Community, that if we are able to um, build a stronger approach, professional approach to statistics, this can make a big difference to improving the wider um, demand for statistical literacy and and the use of the data that um, is now becoming available. And I think that we would all agree that over the last uh, couple of years, the impact of, of COVID um, has in fact brought a much greater awareness of the importance of statistics across many of the countries where um, everyone wanted to know what was happening, um, what were the numbers, how many people were being vaccinated, where and how and so on, um, and also what impacts were happening to communities, to, to employment. The loss of tourism across many countries brought a lot of additional hardship and um, and loss of employment a lot of a lot of businesses were struggling and we were here at SDD and I'm sure at um, the NSOs across the region we were getting many requests from um, a wide range of partners and stakeholders um, what do you know what's going on um, and I think that it really brought home to us that when it comes to getting short term information, there's no better place than from administrative data. We do census or well, we support census. We support um, NSOs in doing household surveys and many other surveys as well. But as we've said, um, you know, often these only happen every two or three or five years or more. Um, and therefore, they're not good at picking up uh, short term changes. But what we do need is more administrative data, even if it's not entirely accurate, the more administrative data on a regular basis that we're able to get um, with the support of NSOs, with the support of key ministries, particularly perhaps around ministries of finance, um, the, the more we will be able to support uh, NSOs in making more sense of that data. And if we're able to make more sense of that data, then we will find that more of the staff in sector ministries will also become more interested in the data. So I think it's it's really important to um, look at the national statistics systems, the national strategies for the development of statistics, and try and really strengthen those and um, advocate very strongly for a stronger NSS in the countries to bring the data together, as is being now proposed uh, for, for Kiribati, and as is also um, being done in Fiji as well. 
So with with that, um, I would just throw open the floor to anyone who would like to pose another question before perhaps we we need to look at um, the time and uh, begin to close the, the meeting for this afternoon. Peter, I, I I can see that you've posted a couple of um, points in the um, in the chat column. W would you like to just say something as as the director of STD? Oh no, thank you. Well, this was great uh, hearing all that. It's all very interesting. I'm particularly interested in the challenge of how we can promote the statistical literacy in in you know the, the likes of Kiribati and PNG. It's really interesting to hear those uh, those talks. And um, but from the ABS angle, I'm interested in the, this idea of the data professionals. So what I was just saying in the chat was, is this something that could apply in the Pacific? And that's a genuine question for the people who are working every day in the Pacific. This idea of promoting data professionals who aren't necessarily working in the National Statistics Office, but still most of their work is on data. But I also just want to remind us all, including myself, that we're also very interested in the statistical literacy of people who definitely do not consider themselves data professionals, but just use it occasionally, the likes of you know, the policy advisors and, and senior managers and journalists and so on. These are very important people. We want to be statistically literate, but we're going to need a, a different sort of intervention to help people like that. So really just a comment that uh, all of the discussion today for me suggests that you know we need to look at a whole range of different types of interventions for different people at different levels. And uh, someone did have their hand up as well. Sorry, Leota um, at uh, Samoa Statistics Bureau, please go ahead. Well, thank you, David. Uh, thank you, Peter, and thank you to all the uh, all the presenters who have made uh, this effort for the uh, for today's uh, meeting. I, I I was quite impressed with some of the moments, especially with the Australian sort of data integration uh, sort of uh, ideas in which uh, we shared a few months ago, uh, but. Uh, my question to Australia is how, like, how, you know, how would they assist the Pacific Island countries uh, in promoting that sort of idea? Uh, and how willing are they to, to, to provide technical assistance uh, uh, in that sense? Uh, so that would be my first question. The, the, my second uh, is just a comment uh, with regards to uh, uh, our friend uh, who is the new advisor in the SPC in terms of capacity building. Uh, especially where he was uh, more presenting uh, in uh, com relative to the SDG and the international sort of uh, indicators. Uh, but uh, I think there was, it's, it's very important that uh, we should also consider national indicator, national priorities indicators uh, at the national level because uh, you know that's where literacy and understanding of the data should be well fitted uh, because there are other international indicators which could not be obtained and could not be relevant to to the uh, at the country level uh, but there are uh, also specific indicators that are most relevant to uh, the country themselves. So it's it's. Uh, I, I've seen. I I I don't know whether we we got the information. Uh, that was uh, that analysis was based. Uh, so it's it's just a comment. Thank you, David. Thank you, Peter, and uh, and the team. Uh, thank you very much. I would I would just like to comment on <clears throat> on the national indicators. So uh, so thank you very much. This is very valid and important point here. 
as uh, during the presentation, I mentioned that we don't know um, the data users. So, so this is this is how we have to dig in with the help of the national um, stakeholders, the NSOs, and the other stakeholders in the NSS to see that when uh, what are the national indicators as per the national development plans. So, uh, those are very important. So, we intend to work with the national stakeholders to make it sure that what Whatever the national indicators are, they are uh, <clears throat> they are reflecting the official statistics that has been produced at the in the country level. That could also help us to identify the gaps that, for example, the, what type of the data that is not available to benchmark the goals or the indicators, which are the national indicators. So uh, in this regard, because this is a platform where we cannot have a wa more wide our uh, long-term engagement to answer all these questions. So in this regard, we um, we are trying to set up the workshops where we uh, will be inviting everyone in, interested in the stakeholders to come forward and discuss with our with us all these challenges. So we can just identify all these problems and then we can work together uh, to address uh, these points. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Nadim. I hope that uh, provided uh, an answer to your question, uh, Leota. Um, it's something that we will be looking at very closely as we move further into developing a new program of uh, statistical literacy and uh, uh, data analysis and re report writing um, uh, program. As as you might recall, a few years ago we we at SDD had a similar program and what we're hoping to do is to dust that off and update it and improve it and uh, respond to the sorts of questions that you have posed to us um, so that we can make it much more relevant to um, today's needs. So over the coming uh, coming few months, uh, you'll be hearing from uh, from Nadim and uh, I'm sure from the rest of us at uh, SDD to uh, to look at what we need and also to take stock of um, what the training needs across all the NSOs in the region are and this will um, enable us to build a, a really comprehensive program of building st not just statistical literacy but hopefully going some way to Peter's comments about building um, more professionalism amongst the cadre of uh, statisticians or maybe not statisticians, um, those who aspire to understand statistics in a better way over the coming coming years and to make more use of, of statistics. So I think um, that that really takes us well beyond our hour and three quarters and I think we need to bring it to a conclusion now unless there is anyone who would like to make um, any final point that we can take on board and maybe get back to you all with a response um, at a at a later date. Uh, David, I think there, there is a first part of the Leota question which was more related to um, ABS. So uh, well, probably, yeah, so we can need to contact ABS to see that what are the opportunities uh, they can explore to work with the countries for the data integration. Yes, this is something that we will take up with, with ABS in, in our discussions with them and we'll flag uh, the the discussion that we've had the question that uh, Leota has uh, has posed and uh, raise this with them during our next uh, next consultations with with ABS about the future program of statistics in the region. So with with uh, no further ado, I would like to thank you all and thank you very much indeed for staying on for this extra uh, 15 minutes or so. Um, I'm hope that you've all found it useful and uh, the recordings and the presentations will be on the on the website uh, very shortly and we'll notify you when that that occurs um, and we will be following up with many of you in the coming weeks to 
take this uh, whole program of statistical literacy and the capacity development um, forward to the next stage. So once again, thank you to our friends and colleagues in SCAP for all the efforts that they've uh, put into managing the, the SCAP side of our, our Stats Cafe today. Thanks, Nadine, for all your work and uh, all our colleagues here at uh, STD. And especially thank you all of you who have uh, contributed, especially our five presenters from, um, from APS, from Kiribati, from uh, Fiji, um, and uh, Mer Merisadita from, uh, from, I'm not quite sure whether you're SCAP, I can't see exactly where you are, but thank you for presenting on behalf of PNG. Um, and thanks, Nadim. And thank you all very much indeed. And good afternoon to you all. And we'll be in touch in the very near future. Thank you and thanks goodbye. All.